Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Sias, and I'm the Advising Center Coordinator in the College of Science Advising Center. Wanted to say uh, welcome, and we're very happy and excited that you're here with us today. There's a few people on the call that I'd like to introduce, so I'll start with Dr. Rahasia. If you'd like to introduce yourself, that would be great. Uh, yes, thank you, Ashley. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Amar Reheja. I am a professor in computer science, also the associate chair of the department. And I'm here to you know, answer any uh, questions and give you a brief update on uh, certain cha curricular changes that we have had this year. Great, yeah. thank, you. thank you. And then we also have Francine as well. Francine, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Yes, um, hi everyone, my name is Francine Bonneville. I'm the STEM Success Initiatives Coordinator. Um, here to provide resources for students who in STEM who are not in first year programs. Great, thank you Francine, appreciate that. All right, so um, just wanna make sure everyone can see my, my presentation well. If you at any point are not able to see it, please let me know just so that I can make sure that um, I'm sharing my screen appropriately. So this is kind of our agenda today. We have some housekeeping items and I'm gonna go through some important dates review some tips for success, um, go over your curriculum, so your degree requirements, um, and then show you some tools and resources for your degree progress report, transfer credit, um, review some advising resources, and then Dr. Rahasia will give some department updates, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay. So just a few housekeeping items. Feel free to put questions in the chat and either I'll try and get through them as I'm answering them um, and going over resources. Um, if not, I'll definitely answer them at the end of this session. Um, we would ask that you update your Zoom name to be your first and last name because I am running a participant list on students who've attended and just marking off that you are in attendance. Um, and then just a friendly reminder, if you could keep yourself muted so everyone can hear, we know that there's pets, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, and so we just want to make sure that since the session is being recorded that you do keep yourself muted. Um, if at the very end you do have questions and want to unmute yourself, that's totally fine. And then just as a disclaimer, the session is being recorded and will be placed on YouTube um, and will be closed captioned so that it, it's accessible for, for everyone and for all peers and colleagues. So the PowerPoint also, as I mentioned earlier, will also be shared um, as well. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of break down this important dates calendar for you. I know I sent this out to you in an email, uh, but this is kind of a flyer that I send out every semester. And it's just basically a heads up and letting you know all the important dates for the term. And so I know we're almost in October, which is crazy to think is the first day of autumn. But um, some things that I wanted to highlight are um, beginning September 18th. So this started last Friday. If let's say you wanna withdraw from a course, you do need to do this now with a serious, with a petition for serious and compelling reasons. Um, what that means is, is you've already passed the time frame of where you can drop yourself um, physically on Bronco Direct. You actually now need to ask for permission to withdraw. Um, there's a few things to consider if you receive financial aid and let's say you're enrolled in 12 units right now and you want to drop a three unit class, you will drop down to nine units. That may impact your financial aid and so you may want to think about excuse me, think about that and discuss those ramifications with an advisor and also with a financial aid counselor as well. So if you find yourself in a situation that's completely outside of your control and you really do need to withdraw, you can contact our office. We can definitely help you through that process, but there's an electronic form that you would need to fill out. In addition to that, there is prior, excuse me, registration for spring classes is coming up in a few weeks. So I know, I know a lot of students, you're getting into the groove, you're brand new students to Cal Poly, you're probably you know, kind of settling in now and, and kind of have you know, a really good and comfortable feeling in your classes, which is great. Um, but we want you to already start thinking about what you need to register for spring of 2021. And so um, registration starts uh, for general registration starts on October 14th. Now, I want to kind of preface this with saying that October 14th is the first day that you'll, that the first day of registration that it opens, but the students on this call, your registration time is probably not going to be on October 14th. The reason for that is usually it goes seniors register first for a few days, then juniors, then sophomores, and then freshmen. 
And so for that reason, um, you will have a specific day and time assigned to you. And in a few slides, I'm gonna show you where that information will be listed. But you always wanna make sure that yes, general registration starts on October 14th, but depending on your class level, it may be a different date. I did wanna highlight the priority registration, which begins October 12th through the 13th. Um, I wanted to share that information with you because if you are either a veteran or you're affiliated with a program that gives you priority registration, that means you get to register before other groups of students. And so if you are in one of those groups, you probably are already aware of that and you will be able to register October 12th through the 13th. Um, the other dates are just, um, uh, again, some additional withdrawal petitions. Um, acknowledging some holidays coming up in November. But the, the, the two dates that I wanted to highlight in, in December are your spring 2021 tuition fees are due December 3rd. Um, and then finals de starts December 7th through December 13th. So like I said, this, this, this flyer of important dates is usually sent out every single semester. And so we encourage you to continue to look through that and you know either print it out or put these, these dates in your calendar just so you're aware. In addition to that, though, you can also follow us on social media because we will also post upcoming dates and say, you know, keep an eye out for this or watch out for this. And so it's important to make sure that you are following us and, and staying connected with the Advising Center. Okay, so just some overall tips for success. And, I, and I've been saying this in my other sessions that I've been having. Um, this really, these, these set tips really can be applied to anyone at Cal Poly Pomona, so not just incoming freshmen and transfer students. So first thing is regularly check your Cal Poly Pomona email. This is very, very important. Um, and so kudos to all of you because you all read your email because you're here with me today, so that's great. Um, but we want you to continue to do that even moving forward. So the Cal Poly Pomona email is the official way that we communicate with students. And therefore, you're going to get emails from your department, from Dr. Rahasia, Dr. Tang, your professors, um, and the advising center. And so it's important that you're constantly checking that email at least once a day. The other thing is regularly check your Bronco Direct account. So you have a student center, and on that, on that student center, you have class information, you have tuition information, you have all kinds of information. So you want to make sure that you're always looking at your Bronco Direct account, making sure you're taking care of any holds, any to-do list items, and I'm gonna show you a screenshot of that in just a second. The other thing is understanding how to read your degree progress report. This is probably your number one tool that you wanna use here at Cal Poly Pomona. This is the tool that we use in order to graduate you um, when, when it's time for you to graduate with your computer science degree. So it's very, very important that you do uh, monitor that. And I have some screenshots to kind of show you what that looks like as well. Next is be aware of advising and registration timeline. So that important dates flyer that I just showed you on the previous slide, this is where this information is very important. You wanna know when advising is, you wanna know when registration begins, you wanna know all that information. So definitely stay in the know. Next is take 30 units per year to stay on track. So for the CS degree, you need to complete a total of 120 units. If you want to graduate within four years, if you divide 120 divided by four, that's about 30 units per academic year. So we say about 15 units a semester. So 15 in fall, 15 in spring. If you don't want to do that or you think that is too much, you can always take some classes in summer to help reduce that load in fall and spring. Next is getting involved in clubs and organizations. I cannot stress this enough, especially in this remote environment. Um, we definitely want you to feel plugged in and connected. And especially since you're new to Cal Poly, this is a great way to, to connect with others. They all meet virtually via Zoom. I know there's Computer Science CS, uh, uh, Computer Science Club uh, Society. So, what, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, I'm forgetting the acronym. What is it, Dr. Rahe, CSS? CSS, correct. Yes, okay, Complete Computer Science Society. I know that they've already started meeting. Um, but my bar has a great um, plethora of options. So it doesn't have to be necessarily computer science related. And some of the clubs and organizations span other, other computer related departments, such as CIS, computer engineering. There's some clubs that kind of collaborate together. Game development, there's she codes, all kinds of clubs and organizations. And I know those clubs have already started reaching out to students. So definitely take advantage of those opportunities. The next thing is academic difficulties. If you are struggling in courses or you know, struggling to kind of understand and grasp the content, especially because we are virtual, 
one, you're not alone. There's a lot of students that are in that same feeling, but please reach out to us, contact the advising center, talk to your faculty. They're here to help you and support you. Get tutoring via the Learning Resource Center. We definitely want you to be successful um, here at Cal Poly Pomona, so that's a way to kind of make sure that you're staying um, you know, on top of your studies. And so we definitely can, are not mind readers, so if you are struggling, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to help you and maybe give you some options. And then lastly, just get regular advising to stay on track. And we're gonna talk about this at, throughout the presentation as well. All right, so transitioning to the degree requirements that are necessary for you to obtain a computer science degree, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up oops, the curriculum sheet for your major. So, okay. All right, so can everyone see my screen here, hopefully, with the curriculum sheet? Okay, perfect. So this is your contract essentially with the university. So you have to complete everything that is listed on this curriculum sheet. At the very top, it says 120 units are required. So as I mentioned earlier, you must complete 120 units in order to graduate from Cal Poly Pomona. In addition to meeting the 120 units though, you have to complete everything listed on this curriculum sheet. So all the classes listed. So I'm gonna go through kind of each area here and explain it in a, in a little bit more detail. So I wanna start off with general education requirements. This is 48 units that are required. The great thing is, is whether or not you change your major out of computer science, these GE areas will still apply to you in the future. So there are five different areas, area A, area B, C, D, and area E. Under some of these areas, there's also sub areas. The key thing that you wanna keep in mind is you must take one class per area. So 1A1, 1A2, one class in A3, et cetera. Um, a lot of you may have AP credit, which is very common. And so some of these GE areas may already be met. And I'm actually gonna show you what that looks like um, in the next few slides. If you're a transfer student, you probably have completed a majority of these GEs, but there are three GEs at least that you have to take at Cal Poly Pomona. That's a B5, C3, and D4. Those are what's called synthesis courses. What that means is they must be taken at a university level and they must be 3,000 to 4,000 level. So like I said, there's different areas and different kind of sub areas that you must complete. The only area that doesn't have a sub area is area E. So you just have to take one class and you fulfill the area E requirement. Now, in addition to that, there's also what's called American Institutions and American Cultural Perspectives. Essentially what the CSU and the Chancellor's Office has required is that every student who graduates from a Cal State University has to take a US history and a California government class. And so what those courses are usually at Cal Poly are History 2202 and Government, which is PLS 2010. As long as you take those two classes in D1 and D2, this American Institutions and American Cultural Perspectives requirement will also be met. Now, if you are a transfer student and you're seeing some red boxes here for these things, reach out to the Advising Center because we can maybe petition for those classes to be met and for that requirement to be met. Lastly is the graduation writing test. Currently, this test is being suspended because it is normally offered in person only. Obviously, because we are virtual in the fall and in the spring, um, this looks a little bit different. So usually I'm telling transfer students who just started with us, you need to go ahead and take your graduation writing test because it's going to become a hold. That's not the case right now, just because it is not, uh, you, students aren't able to complete that requirement. Now, if you are a student that's outside, like you didn't transfer from a California community college, maybe you transferred from out of state, I would definitely recommend that you work with us in the advising center because we can help maybe petition some of your general education courses to get you kind of squared away and fulfill these requirements. In addition to that though, um, there's a bunch of general education course listings that you can find here. And I'm also gonna show you some information on the catalog a little bit later to go over general education. So that's one of the things that I wanted to mention is in general education, if we kind of move over to the left under major required, there are certain GE courses that also double count for you. What that means is they count as a major required class and also as a GE. 
So I want to take biology as an example. Biology 1110 with the lecture and lab covers a B2 and B3 requirement. What that means is it covers this major required requirement and it also covers the life sciences over here, B2 and B3 life sciences and laboratory activity. So it covers both. There are some other courses that do that as well, such as um, Computers and Society, which is a, it's a, a, a course that you need to take. This class says B5, and I wanna highlight it says or D4. A lot of students will say, actually it's supposed to meet both. And I say, no, no, it's only supposed to meet one. So what'll happen is when you take CS 3750, because it's a required class, that'll cover automatically, it'll usually go to B5. And so you, what that means is you can move it to D4 if you would like, but it's gonna automatically usually go to B5. So if you'd like to move it, just reach out to the advising center and we can, we can help you with that. And what we mean by that is it's not going to double count. So it's not going to count as a B5 and D4. It'll just count as a D4 and then you have to take another B5. So that's kind of the, the, the catch there. So in kind of delving into this a little bit more, in the major required section, you have 65 units. That means you have to take every single course listed on this requirement. So there's not really an option here. So you have to take all the courses listed. In addition to these courses, though, there are prerequisites. And so we have some flow charts and a roadmap that I'm going to show you in a second that shows what those prerequisites are. Computer science is very organized and is very, you have to take one course first and then the next course and then it opens up additional courses. So you need to make sure that you're planning that, that correctly. The other thing though that I wanted to mention is that the computer science degree curriculum has changed significantly in this year. So what that means is you were admitted, all of you on this call were admitted under the 2020 to 2021 curriculum. So you'll want to see here at the very top right hand corner, it always tells you what the curriculum year is. You always want to be sure that you're looking at this curriculum year and not last year, so not 2019 and 2020 or next year's 2021 because you are held to the standards based on this curriculum because you are admitted under this curriculum. The reason why I say that is last year there was additional math requirements, there was additional physics requirements, and those are no longer required. And so you want to make sure that you're looking at this specific list and at these specific degree requirements. Now, in addition to your major required classes, so again, you have no choice here, you have to take all of these classes listed here, there is what's called major electives, which is a total of 19 units. And so I wanna kind of explain this because a lot of students get confused here. So what this means is you must take at least 12 units from this list, so at least four classes essentially from this list, and then if you would like, you can take no more than five units here and no, no more than two units here. What we mean by this is you do not have to take classes in these areas. However, to meet the 19 units, it may be beneficial for you to take a one unit class to meet that 19. We will not petition another course to have to fulfill that 19 units. You must fulfill those 19 units. In addition to that though, with computer science, I cannot stress this enough, and I just met with five students in the last week um, expressing to me the importance of having an internship, especially as a CS major. Very, very important for degree, um, excuse me, for job prospects once you graduate. And so we have an internship class that you can take. Usually most students will take an internship in the summer of some sort, or they may work on a project, which is also another great thing. Projects and internships are really great because they show future employers how you're applying the knowledge that you have. So it's great to have completed the courses, but if you don't have any hands-on experience or any demonstration on your resume to show that you're understanding computer science languages and, and concepts, that's really going to, um, you know, impact you for, for job opportunities. But I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rahasia, just in case he wanted to share anything a little bit more specifically about electives. Oh, and you're on mute, Dr. Rahasia, sorry. Okay. There we go. <laughs> I was, I actually had made some um, additions to your PowerPoint, but it just, uh, for some reason, it just crashed. Um, let me just see. Can I share my screen? 
I believe so. You're a co-host, so I, I, I believe you'd be able to, yes. Okay. I can uh, stop. Here, yeah, let me stop sharing and then you, you, you should be able okay. to. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so I hope uh, everybody can see my screen now. So a, a couple of things I just wanted to mention here, as uh, Ashley already mentioned, that uh, please make sure about the new curriculum 2021, the, the, the curriculum sheet that she showed you, because there, are, there have been a lot of changes in the courses from the last year. So uh, one thing that another change that we just made was that statistics 2260 you know, has been added as a prerequisite for 3310, uh, which is obviously the core required course. So please make sure uh, that try to, at least for freshmen, uh, please make sure you finish taking this course by the end of your second year. And if you're a transfer student, uh, I would take this course right away, okay? So please uh, make a note of that based on whether you're a freshman or a transfer student, uh, because a lot of times students end up, you know, we're trying to wait to take this class like just before graduation. But that was possible because this was not a prerequisite uh, until much later for an upper division class, you know, a, a four level class, but now it's a prerequisite for 3310 and also for 4310 starting next year, right? So please make sure uh, to take this class uh, as soon as you can, okay? Uh, also, uh, as Ashley just showed you, the two units in the curriculum sheet uh, on the bottom, which uh, we're talking about senior project and internship, even though you are not obviously required to take, you know, no more than two units from there, but I would highly advise you to look into taking either a senior project or an internship. So for, if you want to do a senior project, it's basically working with a professor uh, in your area of interest. So you have say a specific interest in certain areas, go on the, the CS website, look at the research interests of professors that you can easily find. Might be, I can uh, quickly, uh, share over here um, with you. Um, let's see if I can pull up um, the department website. Just a second. So here, as you can see, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay. So here, if you look under the undergraduate program, a lot of the resources are over here. It shows you how to sign up for this 4610, 4620. You know, so basically you can get in touch with one of the faculty members that you would like to work with. And if you look under faculty members here, there are faculty research interests mentioned for all the faculty members, as you can see over here. So look at, you know, um, what your research interests match in and towards your uh, junior and senior year, probably senior year is a good time to do this, to take a one unit or a two unit uh, senior project to do an independent study with the professor. Uh, same thing with, uh, with the <clears throat> internship as well. If you wanna do an internship, I would uh, recommend that make sure that you're doing it only in the fall or the spring semester because a summer internship does not count. Uh, so you cannot really register for the internship class over the summer. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that might be possible later on, but those are, that was a change that was made recently uh, because of the pandemic. So please make sure that if you are doing an internship with a company, uh, the process of that is also listed under student resources on the website that I just showed you under the de department. So please follow the process. Uh, and me and Dr. Chang do have office hours every week. Uh, on, uh, I think hers are on Monday, mine are on Tuesday, but you can look online on the Blackboard Advising website. Uh, the Zoom meeting ID is there. My, mine are on Wednesday uh, <clears throat> from 10 to 11. So please feel free to, you know, uh, drop by during the Zoom office hours if you have any other advising questions. So that's about it that I wanted to update. Okay, thank you, Dr. Asia. We did have a question in the chat and it said, is the internship for computer science, a class on how to find an internship or prepare for one, or is it guaranteeing students that enroll in the class will be given an internship opportunity? 
That's a great question. It's not a class on how to prepare for an internship. It's when a student already has an internship and they are actually, so uh, essentially for internships, there's one of two ways. Either you need to get paid or you need to receive class credit. You cannot work for free. So you have to have one of those options. Right. If your internship is unpaid, then you actually have to enroll in a class so that you actually get credit for the work that you're doing. So usually, as Dr. Raheja said, there's a website that kind of goes over more detail about the internship. And I'll definitely be sure to share those links with you uh, all after this presentation. Cool. So whatever company that you're actually doing internship with, they have to actually fill out some paperwork with Cal Poly right. to, be, to be in the database. And then, you know, officially, you are then enrolled in that class. Once they have filled the paperwork, there's paperwork for you and for paperwork for the company. So please go ahead and do lo look at the description of the requirements on the website uh, for under student resources regarding the internship. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Rahejir. Sure, thanks, Ashley. Um, so in addition to that, there was the curriculum sheet. So kind of describing those electives and things like that. There's also a little cheat sheet that, um, that we've made with the department through the years that shows kind of the different areas of interest and then maybe what, what electives you should be taking to fulfill those areas. So I'll definitely share that as well as a resource um, and it's also on the CS website as well. Um, in addition to that though, I wanted to just show a few other things as we kind of move along. So one is this general education course list. So as I was mentioning earlier with the curriculum, there's different GE areas with different units and things like that. And so you may wanna know what classes can I take in these different areas? So here's a list here and you can actually click through each link to read a little bit more information. Um, I do wanna highlight and make sure that everyone is on the same page that for area B, a lot of the classes that you need to take are already gonna be fulfilled by your major. So for example, for B1, you're gonna take physics 1510. For B2, you're going to take Bio 1110. Those are all required classes already. The other GE areas outside of B, those are the ones that you're mainly going to be focusing on and that you have a choice and you have a, a wide range of classes that you can choose from. In addition to that, though, there's also what's called the university catalog. So what this means is you can technically put in any course here into CS, let's say, for example, CS 1300, which is discrete structures, and it'll tell you what the prerequisites are for that class. A prerequisite means you have to take one of these classes before you actually take, um, take the CS 1300 course. And I just wanna make sure everyone can see this catalog screen that I'm looking at here. Okay, perfect. Um, in addition to that though, I know we were talking a little bit about curriculum sheet. On this website, we also have what's called a roadmap. This roadmap kind of breaks down year by year on what classes you should be taking in order to graduate within the four years. In addition to that though, it has class pairings, but it also has prerequisite information so that you don't have to look up every single class on the catalog. You can also look at the roadmap as well that has that prerequisite information. So again, I'll be sharing all of that information with you. And the same, like I said, with the curriculum sheet, you definitely want to be looking at a roadmap that's the 2020 to 2021, because if you look at another roadmap, that's going to include other classes that are not required any, any longer. <clears throat> okay. So next is just kind of showing you a few examples of your student center and your degree progress report. There's two videos here that the university has created to kind of answer some of these questions that you may have. Um, but I'm not, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through each video, but like I said, you're going to receive these links so you can watch these on your own time. But before we dive into that, I wanted to show you a screenshot of a student center. So this is actually an incoming freshman this year. Um, obviously, I've hidden their information and their name for, for privacy purposes. And so this student is enrolled in these classes this fall term. And so this is basically your main student center page. And what I wanted to highlight are a few boxes on this right hand side here. First is holds. You always want to make sure you're looking at this top right hand box to make sure that you do not have a, a hold of any sort. Right now, because of the pandemic, we have not placed any advising holds on students records. However, usually every some, once a year, at least once a year, you're going to receive a CS advising hold which means you have to meet with an advisor or go through our advising process to get that hold removed. Um, like I said, though, because of the pandemic, that is not currently happening. 
That doesn't mean you don't need to get in get advising. We would definitely recommend that you do, but it's not required. However, this particular student does have a financial hold. So what this means is, is that they, this hold can prevent them from registering for classes. So they need to go ahead and click the details of this hold to make sure that they're fulfilling that requirement so that this does not impact registration when it comes up in October. Next thing is to-do list. So this student, for example, needs to turn in their immunization records. What this means is, is if they don't turn this in by the date listed in the more details right here, then they're gonna actually get a hold for this, for this requirement. So you always wanna make sure that you're looking at this student center in the holds and the to-do list box to make sure you don't have anything preventing you from registering for classes. Classes fill up very quickly, especially CS courses. And so you want to make sure that you're registering and you're available and you're ready to go on your specific day and time. Which leads me to my next point, which is enrollment dates. So as I kind of mentioned, registration starts October 14th. But everyone on this call, you are going to be receiving a specific day and time to register. So I get a lot of emails on registration day because they'll say, Registration was supposed to start, you know, and my registration date was October 14th, but I can't register for classes. What ends up happening is I'll look at the student's account and their time was actually maybe 5 p.m. on October 14th. So just because it's October 14th doesn't mean it's going to start right at 8 a.m. So you want to make sure that you're looking at the specific date and time to make sure that you are, um, you are learning and, and preparing for that in a timely manner. Um, in addition to that, though, this, this obviously gives you a screenshot of all of your classes, and so you just want to make sure that you're constantly looking at the student center. The next thing, though, is your degree progress report. So the resources that I've kind of gone through so far are your curriculum sheet, which is kind of your contract with the university, your roadmap, <clears throat> and then the last thing is your degree progress report, which is this screen here. This is very, very important because this is what we use to graduate you. So to get your computer science degree in either two years as a transfer student or four years as a freshman, you need to make sure that you are looking at this. So anytime you meet with an advisor, we're most likely going to pull this up with you. A few things that I wanted to know. So one is this is, an, this is an example of a freshman that just started with us here at Cal Poly Pomona. The reason I know they are a freshman is because they have no GPAs listed here. As a transfer student, you will have an overall GPA because you came in with already a GPA from your community college or your previous institution. However, every student that's new here at Cal Poly Pomona, you are not gonna have any GPA listed because you haven't completed any courses yet. The other area that I wanted to highlight is the year, the curriculum year. So a lot of students will say, I forgot what year I started here at Cal Poly Pomona. That information is always listed on your degree progress report. So again, you are held to the standards based on the fall 2020 to 2021 curriculum year. The other areas that I've highlighted are just kind of the legends and icons here. The main thing that you want to focus on are on these little icons. So green check mark means you've completed the course or course is completed or you've met the requirement. Yellow diamond means the course is currently in progress. And red box means requirement not completed. Basically, at the end of your time here at Cal Poly Pomona, we don't want to see any red boxes. We want to see green check marks and yellow diamonds. And so that's what we are kind of looking for. The last thing is expanding all. You always want to expand all to see all the different areas that are hidden in the degree progress report. This report is very long. If you were to print it, it's probably like 15 to 16 pages. And so it has a lot of different things that you want to make sure that you're looking at. Um, so right below this screen, there's usually this screen here, which details all of the degree requirements for units. So as I mentioned, you need 120 units to graduate. And so this particular student has taken 37, so they need 83 units left to, to the degree. As a transfer student, you also have to take a certain amount of units here at Cal Poly Pomona. In residence means here at Cal Poly Pomona or on the Cal Poly Pomona campus or in a Cal Poly Pomona course. And so you wanna make sure that you're always looking at this information as well. Okay, so now I wanna show you two examples of a freshman and then a transfer computer science student. So first off is a freshman. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of freshmen have AP credit. And so that information can always be listed on the transfer credit report. 
So this is a particular freshman that was admitted this past fall semester, or this is their first semester. They received a, a three on their AP English language exam. So this is this information here. So then a lot of students, their next question will say, okay, actually, so I got a three on this exam. What type of credit did I receive? So this student received an area A2 or English 1103 credit. And the way that I know that is then I go to the degree progress report, which is this next screenshot here, and I see a little green check mark. So this student received credit for AP English with the English 1103, and so they have a little green check mark here. This is also a good example because it shows you all three of the different icons. So next, it also shows you that the student is currently enrolled in critical thinking. So they're enrolled in fall of 2020, so yellow diamond means in progress, as the legend in the screen previously showed. And then the last thing is a red box. So this student still needs to complete an A1 or an oral communication course. And so this is just kind of an important screenshot here. Now I'm gonna pause because I see I have two questions in the chat. So um, someone asked, holds will be removed after the requirements are fulfilled. I haven't been able to visit my local hospital for shots. Um, and so I know it will turn into a hold because I can't get my shots in time. So you can always contact the office that has placed that requirement on your to-do list um, just to make sure that it doesn't become a hold and they can work with you to fulfill that requirement. But if you do have it fulfilled, then yes, it will no longer be a to-do list item um, and it will not move into a hold, the holds area. And then the transfer question, I'm going to actually answer that in just a second. So I'll go ahead and wait on that one. So this is a freshman and then this is a transfer. So right now, which is going to answer this next question in the chat, there's a lot of students that have applied and we admitted um, a lot of students this past summer. So the registrar's office is currently working on processing all of the transcripts from all of our students that were admitted this past summer. Their hope and goal is to have that done by, uh, by the time you register for classes. So by the time middle of October, your courses should be listed on your transfer credit and your degree progress report. Um, but I did wanna show you what an example will look like once that does happen. So this particular student transferred in from Citrus College. And so they have all of their coursework listed on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side are the courses that they are articulated to. And so what I wanted to show you was, again, an example on the degree progress report. So because the student completed these classes on the right-hand side, their degree progress report is marked off as, as such. So they have CS 1300 green check mark, 1400 green check mark, 2400 green check mark. And so they're currently enrolled in CS 2600, which shows a yellow diamond. So as I mentioned, the transfer credit is still being processed. And I know we've worked with the registrar's office very closely this summer to kind of report any issues. I know Dr. Rahasia and Diana, who's one of our advisors in our advising center, also worked with a lot of you to write petitions as well as transfer students. If you have questions though, once your report has been updated, you can always reach out to the advising center and we'll be able to help you and work, work with you on that. Okay, so some other helpful resources as we're kind of uh, coming to a close here. One is the Advising Center website. So I cannot stress this enough. Um, we are the main advisors for computer science students. So Dr. Rahasia and Dr. Ting um, are also available as well. And so they have some office hours, but in addition to that, you can always contact the Advising Center because we are, are kind of the main, the main advisors for you. So I wanted to show you our website because the way that you can make and schedule appointments with us are through CPP Connect. And so that is the way that you can see our availability and schedule appointments with us. In addition to this though, we also have a career advisor that you can also meet with. He's available Thursdays from two to four. However, in addition to all of this, CPP Connect and everything like that, we actually have a Blackboard page that I wanted to show you. All of you have been added to this, been added to this organization called Computer Science Online Advising Fall 2020. First, I'm going to put this video, because I'm recording it, we're going to put it here on this website, but there's also been another video that was created as well that can be beneficial to you. So a lot of this information is going to be in this video that I'm going to share, but also this, video, this other video as well. Keep in mind though, as a new student, there may be some, some things mentioned in this other video that may not necessarily apply to you. But we have all this information, so you have all this available at your fingertips. Um, and then if after viewing all this information, you still have questions, 
you can definitely reach out to us and make an appointment or email us if you'd like as well. Okay. In addition to the advising center, I wanted to just kind of highlight another thing, permission numbers. If you do need a permission number and you're getting like an error message when you try and enroll in classes, you will need to work with that specific department. So if you're getting an error message for maybe let's say a computer science class, you'll have to work with Annie or Nicole in the computer science office. Or if you're getting an error message for a math class, you would need to contact the math department. And on our website, we actually have, an, we have that information here. Under permission number information, we have a screenshot of all the department contact information. It's just very important to know that, yes, we can help you with a lot of your questions. However, for permission numbers, we do not have access to that information. Okay. Um, let's see. The other, other thing that I wanted to talk about is Bronco 411. I'm not going to go through each of these links just for the sake of time, but a lot of students will ask, oh, I want to know, let's say, what Dr. Raheja's email address is. This is actually the directory here, so you can always put in an, a, an advisor's information or a faculty member's information and put in that their name and their, their information will pop up. One, their office location when we're back on campus but to their email address as well. The other thing though that I wanted to highlight is the Learning Resource Center. We just actually published a bunch of information about helpful workshops for like physics and math and calculus. I'm gonna send all that workshop information to you um, just so you have that, but it's also posted on the Learning Resource Center page and on our Advising Center website too. Basically, we just wanna make sure that you, you are not struggling in courses and if you are, that you're getting the help that you need by getting tutoring or you know, partnering with a peer to kind of help you navigate some of those questions. The other thing is a registration guide. So this is just kind of a guide. A lot of students will ask me, okay, actually at orientation, we all sat on a, you know, on a Zoom room together and we registered for classes. When you register for spring classes, that's not gonna be the case. You're gonna be registering on your own. So you wanna make sure that you're looking at your curriculum sheet, your roadmap, your degree progress report to know what classes you have to take. Even when you make an appointment with us, we usually will want you to have a schedule in mind already because you have those tools and resources. We wanna empower you as a student to make that plan for yourself. And then we can always look at that plan and give you recommendations. So this registration guide is very important. It kind of goes through everything that I just talked about, about like how to, you know, look at your degree progress report, look at your curriculum sheet. It talks about permission numbers, waitlisting. So this link is also available to you on that PowerPoint that I'm sharing with you. We talked about the Blackboard page already, so I'm not gonna go into detail there. And then the last thing is Student Success Central, which is just another resource of, of information with videos as well. Okay, so just kind of to wrap up here, if you are struggling in a course, you know, please seek out tutoring, connect with your faculty during office hours. There's the Counseling Center as well that's available and they're virtual as well to help you. The Disability Resource Center, but then also us as well. We are here to help you in the College of Science Advising Center. So if you ever have a question, you can always reach out to us and we'll be sure to kind of lead you and guide you in those next steps. And I know Dr. Rahasia kind of already went through those department specific updates. I don't know if there was anything else you wanted to say, Dr. Rahasia, or? No, I think um, we are good. I mean, if they have any questions, as you mentioned, they can get in touch with us, you know, yes. uh, by email or during the office hours. I yes. Think. And, and just to kind of highlight on the on the Blackboard page, as Dr. Rahasia mentioned, there is Dr. Rahasia and Dr. Ting. It has their office hours here. And it also has the Zoom link, uh, Zoom ID information here as well. So you can always, always do that too. Um, and so just as we're kind of wrapping up here, I wanted to kind of go back to our uh, social media and put the plug in here for that. If you have any questions, I would really encourage you, one, to look at our YouTube channel. We have a ton of videos on there that are very, very helpful. So pretty much when we get a question, we usually will make a video to answer that question. Because if you have that question, chances are five other students have that same question. The other thing though is we're on Twitter and we're also on Instagram. So please feel free to, uh, or please follow us just to stay in the know, because um, we put a lot of important information on there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording, but we'll go ahead and stay on the line. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put them in the chat or unmute yourself. So let me go ahead and, and do that. Hold on one second.